What's up, YouTube? It's your boy, Cody Boy. Have you ever wondered how pilots can land in dense fog or really low ceilings on a bad weather day? Well, today we're learning about the Instrument Landing System, or ILS, the bread and butter of any instrument-rated pilot. Strap in and hang on, because you're watching Toolkit. An instrument landing system, or ILS, is a precision approach system that uses radio waves to give pilots horizontal and vertical guidance to get through the weather and down to the runway. The FAA dictates that every ILS will be made up of at least three basic components. The localizer, the glide slope, the outer marker, and for more precise category two or category three ILSs, an inner marker. An ILS can also be divided into three functional groups. First, you have your guidance information, which is your localizer and glide slope. Next is the range information, which is your marker beacons or DME. And then you have visual information, airport approach lighting, touchdown centerline lights, and runway lights. First, let's talk about the localizer. The localizer is a transmitter that operates on one of 40 ILS channels within the frequency range of 108.10 to 111.95. These signals provide horizontal left-right guidance for the pilot to an extended center line all the way out to 18 nautical miles. Localizers can be identified by a three-letter identifier preceded by the letter I transmitted on the localizer frequency. A localizer will provide course guidance through the descent path to the runway threshold from a distance of 18 nautical miles from the antenna between an altitude of 1,000 feet above the highest terrain along the course line and 4,500 feet above the elevation of the antenna site. Every localizer within the national airspace will provide valid off-course indications 10 degrees left to right of centerline from a range of 10 to 18 nautical miles. Within 10 nautical miles, that cone expands to 35 degrees left to right of course. All charted procedures with localizer coverage beyond 18 nautical miles have been through an approval process for expanded service volume have been validated by flight inspection. A localizer that provides course guidance more than three degrees offset from centerline and less than 30 degrees offset from centerline is considered a localizer type directional aid. If a localizer provides course guidance greater than 30 degrees offset from runway centerline, only circling minimums will be published. Up next is the glide slope or glide path. The UHF glide slope transmitter operates on one of 40 ILS channels. The term glide path means the portion of the glide slope that intersects the localizer. The glide slope transmitter is located between 750 and 1250 feet from the approach end of the runway and offset between 250 and 650 feet from runway centerline. The glide slope transmitter transmits a glide path beam 1.4 degrees wide vertically. The signal provides descent information for navigation down to the lowest authorized decision height specified in the approved ILS approach procedure. The glide path may not be suitable for navigation below the lowest authorized decision height, and any references to glide path indications below decision height must be supplemented by visual reference to the runway environment. Glide paths with no published decision height are usable all the way down to the runway threshold. The glide path projection angle is normally adjusted to 3 degrees above horizontal so that it intersects the middle marker at 200 feet and the outer marker at 1400 feet above runway elevation. The glide slope is normally usable to a distance of 10 nautical miles, however at some indications the glide slope has been certified for an extended service volume which exceeds 10 nautical miles. It should be noted that the published glide slope threshold crossing height does not represent the height of actual glide path on course indication above the runway threshold. Rather, it represents the height above the runway threshold that the aircraft's glide slope antenna should be. So for larger aircraft with the large distance between the glide slope antenna and landing gear, considerations need to be applied to make sure that you're not landing short of the runway. Now let's talk about distance measuring equipment, or DME. When DME is installed on the ILS and specified in the approach procedure, you can use it for three things. First, you can substitute it in lieu of the outer marker. 
Second, you can use it as a back course final approach fix. And third, you can use it to establish other fixes on the localizer course. In some cases, DME from a separate facility may be used within TERPS limitations to 1. Provide ARC initial approach segments 2. As a FAF for back course approaches and 3. As a substitute for the outer marker. The last thing you need to know about shooting an ILS approach is the marker beacons. The FA says the following things are valid substitutes for the outer marker. A compass locator, precision approach radar, airport surveillance radar, DME, VOR, NDBs in the standard instrument approach procedure, or a suitable RNAV GPS capable of fixed identification on a standard instrument approach procedure. ILS systems have an associated outer marker. A middle marker is no longer required, and locations with a Category 2 ILS also have an inner marker. The FAA lays out the following requirements for the use of marker beacons. An outer marker, or suitable substitute that identifies the final approach fix for non-precision approach procedures. The middle marker indicates position approximately 3,500 feet from the landing threshold. This is also the position where the aircraft on glide pad will be at an altitude approximately 200 feet above the elevation of the touchdown zone. Middle markers are no longer required. There are some middle markers still in use, but the FAA is not installing middle markers on new ILS sites. And an inner marker, where installed, indicates the point at which an aircraft is at decision height on the glide path during a Category 2 ILS approach. An inner marker is only required for CAT-2 operations that do not have a published radio altitude minimum. The minimums for different ILS categories are as follows. For Category 1 ILSs, decision height will be 200 feet and RVR at 2400 feet. With touchdown zone and centerline lighting or aircraft equipped with autopilot, flight directors, or HUDs, RVR can be reduced to 1800 feet. Special Authorization Category 1 ILSs have a decision height of 1,500 feet and an RVR of 1,400 feet, HUD to decision height. Category 2 ILSs have a decision height of 100 feet and RVR of 1,200 feet, with auto land or HUD to touchdown and noted on authorization, RVR can be reduced to 1,000 feet. Special Authorization Category 2 ILSs with reduced lighting have decision height of 100 feet and RVR of 1200 feet with auto land or HUD to touchdown and noted on authorization touchdown zone centerline lighting and ALSF2 are not required. Category 3A ILSs can go down to no decision height or decision height below 100 feet with RVR not less than 700 feet. Category 3B ILSs have no decision height or decision height below 50 feet and RVR less than 700 feet, but not less than 150 feet. And category 3C ILSs have no decision height or RVR limitation. It should be noted that special authorization and equipment are required for category 2 and 3 ILSs. Every pilot should be aware that vehicles and aircraft operating near the localizer or glide slope antennas can often interfere or cause disturbances to the frequencies they put out. For this reason, ILS critical areas are established near each localizer and glide slope antenna. When ceilings are less than 800 feet or visibility less than 2 nautical miles, no aircraft or vehicle will be authorized in or over the critical area when an aircraft is using the ILS and inside of the outer marker. The only exception to this are aircraft that land, exit a runway, depart, or execute a missed approach. Additionally, Whenever the official weather observation is a ceiling of less than 200 feet or RVR less than 2,000 feet, vehicles or aircraft will not be authorized in or over the area when the aircraft is inside the middle marker or in the absence of a middle marker a half nautical mile final. For glide slope critical areas, vehicles and aircraft are not authorized in or over the area when an arriving aircraft is inside of the outer marker or the fix used in lieu of the outer marker. The only exception to this is when the arriving aircraft has reported the runway in sight and is using sidestepping to land to another runway. Critical area protection is not provided when ceilings are at or above 800 feet 
where visibility exceeds two nautical miles. All flight crew should still advise the tower that it will conduct an auto land or coupled approach under these conditions. In order to descend out of the decision height for an ILS, you must satisfy three criteria. First, the aircraft must be in a safe position to transition to land. Second, the pilot must observe flight visibility that exceeds or meets the minimums of the published approach. And third, you must be able to distinctly identify one of the approved visual references for the runway, also called the runway environment. Many lights make up the runway environment. In order to descend out of decision height and descend to 100 feet above the touchdown zone, the pilot only needs to see the approach lighting system and nothing else. In the graphic, you can see the approach lighting system for CAT 2 runways and CAT 1 runways. Note that non-precision runways shouldn't have an ILS anyways, but there is no approach lighting system extended beyond the runway threshold. Once established at 100 feet, the pilot must see one of the following things in order to continue down and make a landing. First is the approach lighting system's red terminating bars or red side row bars used on ALSF1 and ALSF2 systems. Next is the runway threshold, the threshold lights, runway in identifier lights, the flashing strobes on the corner of the runway's approach threshold, the visual approach slope indicators, which are VASIs or PAPIs, touchdown zone or touchdown zone markings, touchdown zone lights, runway or runway markings, or the runway lights. Well, that's everything you could possibly know about the instrument landing system, one of the most critical tools in modern aviation, and now another one you can put in your toolkit. Thank you for making it this far, and I'll leave you with this one cool fact. The Space Shuttle's instrument approach begins at 50,000 feet in Mach 2, where it descends to intercept an ILS, where it shoots down final at 350 knots. Here's some footage. Main gear touchdown. Atlantis' nose being now rotated down toward the runway. The uh, chute being deployed. And nose gear touchdown. Space Shuttle Atlantis now comes home to the Kennedy Space Center for the final time in 25 years. 32 flights and more than 120 million miles traveled. The legacy of Atlantis now in the history books. If you enjoyed this video and like to see more, please, uh, you know, like and subscribe. Leave some feedback and uh, feel free to let me know what you'd like to see in the future. Thanks. See ya.